Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning, for this third Sunday of Easter, the Misericordia Domini, Good Shepherd Sunday, we'll consider our Gospel lesson, John chapter 10, together with our Old Testament and Epistle lessons, which all have to do with this theme of Christ as our Good Shepherd. And we'll take as our starting point uh, the 11th verse of John 10. Jesus says simply, I am the Good Shepherd. This is the text. Dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Christ Jesus, what a comforting image that is to picture Jesus Christ as our Good Shepherd. We have no shortage of paintings depicting Him bathed in sunlight as He is out in the pasture in the trappings of a shepherd's staff in hand. Sheep gathered dutifully and eagerly around him, and a lamb carried across his shoulders. We like to picture ourselves as that lamb, secure under the care of our Good Shepherd. But as with any metaphor, and yes, this is a metaphor, there are specific points of comparison. In what way? Is Jesus a shepherd? You have to ask that with uh, other metaphors too. Jesus says, I am the door. In what way is Jesus a door? He's not made of wooden planks. He doesn't turn on hinges. But He does grant access. Because through Him we enter into eternal life. How is Jesus a shepherd? He's not a shepherd because he feeds literal sheep. He's a shepherd because he has some things in common with an earthly shepherd. Actually, he has quite a few things in common. This is just about an inexhaustible metaphor. But I'd like to focus on three points in particular by which Jesus is similar to an earthly shepherd. First... As a shepherd leads his sheep, so Jesus leads, guides his people. Second, as a shepherd feeds his sheep, so Jesus feeds his people. Third and finally, as a shepherd protects and defends his sheep, so Jesus protects and defends his people. And as we consider those three points of comparison that Jesus leads, feeds, and defends, I like to think of them both in terms of Jesus' earthly ministry. How did He Himself personally and directly discharge this office of shepherd? But then, how does Jesus even now discharge that office through those who are still called shepherds? You know what the word pastor means? It's a Latin word. It's simply the Latin word for shepherd. Pastors are shepherds because we are called to follow the example of Jesus in leading God's people, feeding God's people, and defending God's people. So, to start with leading. Shepherds certainly need to lead their sheep because sheep are very much in need of being led. Sheep love to wander. They love to get into trouble. And boy, sure do we. We love to stray into fields that are harmful for us. We love to wander into dangerous territory. We love to frolic amongst noxious weeds. We love to do things that are dangerous for us, that imperil us. Even if they don't seem that dangerous to us, we are flirting with disaster by wandering from God's fold. And so it is the task of our Good Shepherd to lead us back. And how did Jesus lead His sheep out of their dangerous climbs and back into His fold. 
By teaching them. By instructing. And by instructing in what? By instructing in the law of God. Jesus instructed both by actual oral teaching and also by example. We hear that in our epistle lesson from St. Peter, that we are to follow the example of him who proves to be the shepherd and bishop of our souls, Jesus Christ. We follow his example in that he did not respond violently to his persecutors. He didn't talk back when he was reviled, but he suffered all things in meekness and in peace, trusting in his Father. So we also are led by Christ to follow his example and suffer patiently all of those things that God may send our way. But then in his teaching... I would say there is no more severe teacher of the law than Jesus Christ. That's because from many, even good teachers of the law, even other scriptural teachers of the law, even prophets, one could leave with the impression that if we just do the right things, we can render ourselves right with God. But Jesus teaches the law of God in such a way that we know that our deeds have no power to save us, that God's law regulates even the heart. You see that most clearly in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, not only are you committing murder by actually killing someone, but you're also breaking the fifth commandment in your heart when you hate someone, when you wish someone ill, when you are consumed with anger toward your brother. So also with the sixth commandment, we have committed adultery not just when we actually step out on a spouse, but every wandering glance, every lustful thought of the heart constitutes a breaking of that commandment. And that shows us that the law of God as preached by Jesus Christ is intended to lead and guide us, not just by showing us the way we should go and keeping us from those dangerous regions, but also by showing us that we can't get to where we need to go by revealing to us that we are impossibly lost, that we need our shepherd to come himself and take us up on his shoulders and bring us back to the fold. And that's what he does. Now, even pastors are intended to join in this work of guiding, leading. And how do pastors do that? Well, hopefully the way Jesus did, by instruction and example. I hope that pastors can set good examples, that we can display patience and suffering, that we can show meekness and a a fleeing from unnecessary contention. But also, it is the task of the pastor and following in the footsteps of the Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ, to instruct in the law. And so, yes, it is my sacred duty as a pastor in Christ's church to teach you God's law to reveal the ways that this world has gone astray and the way back to Christ's fold. And yes, it is also my task to thunder with God's law so that you know how lost you would be without the forgiveness of your sins in Christ Jesus. That leads me to the second task of the shepherd that we'll consider this morning. Jesus not only leads his flock... He also feeds his flock. After all, what's the purpose of the leading? It's to get his sheep out of the bad places and into the good place. And what's the good place? It's the pleasant pasture, where there is plenty of food to nourish Christ's sheep, where there is clear water flowing so that they need not thirst. And how does Jesus feed his sheep. Once he has led us by his law into his green pasture, what does he feed us with? Well, Jesus says that he is the bread of life. He feeds us with himself. That is, he causes us to believe in him, to draw our spiritual nourishment from him through the proclamation of the gospel. The law drives us to that place where we gladly hear and learn the gospel of God, 
the glad tidings that through His death on our behalf we have the forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. That is truly to be fed by our Good Shepherd. To have Him presented to us that we may believe in Him and draw forgiveness, life, and salvation from Him. Now Jesus certainly taught that gospel. Jesus forgave sins. But He also actively gave Himself for the life of the world. He laid down His life for His sheep that thereby he might feed them. By giving himself up unto death on the cross, Jesus was feeding his flock with his own flesh and blood, which we eat and drink through faith in him. So also pastors are called to feed Christ's sheep. If all a pastor does is thunder with God's law, he may be leaving Christ's sheep worse off than they began. But if, having threatened and cajoled with the law of God, the pastor then leads the sheep to the green pasture of the gospel of Jesus Christ, well, that is truly the pastoral task, to feed the sheep on Christ. That's why you're here today. You have been led here by your shepherd, your good shepherd, Jesus Christ, leading and guiding you by his Spirit, that here you might feed upon your shepherd. You might receive bread from his hands. You might be satisfied with his flesh, his blood, with the living water that flows forth from him. And that comes to you through nothing else than the forgiveness of your sins. The promise that those sins revealed to you by that terrifying law of God have been punished in your good shepherd who has laid down his life for you and you have forgiveness in His name and the promise of life everlasting. That is to lead and to feed the sheep of God, to guide them according to God's law and to nourish them with the gospel. And yet even then, if that's all that a pastor is doing, he is still not entirely discharging his office because there's something else critical that Jesus does as our Good Shepherd. He also defends us. He fights off the wolves. The devil roams about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But in his wanderings he encounters the Good Shepherd. He encounters Christ. And what to us is a pleasant image that fills us with security and comfort is to the devil a terrifying image because Jesus, our Good Shepherd, who protects us and keeps us safe, does so by His club by which He batters that devil and crushes his head and destroys him. Jesus is only as good a shepherd to us as He is a terrifying shepherd to the devil and his minions. And yes, by His death on the cross, Jesus has crushed the head of the serpent. He has destroyed the devil, done away with sin and death. And he has warned us against the continued machinations of the devil. Yes, the devil has lost the cosmic conflict, but he's still fighting over our souls. He's still trying to catch sheep as they stray so that he can drag them off to his own den. Jesus warned us about false Christs, about those who would come preaching a false gospel in his name. The apostles, too, joined Jesus in warning against false doctrine and warning against the teachings of demons, things designed to lead Christians astray. So also pastors in Christ's church are called to warn the sheep of God against false teaching. Now the fact is, I can't remember that many times when I've singled out specific false teachings and addressed them, especially when I've named false teachers. I kind of got into some trouble during my vicarage for naming Joel Osteen as a false teacher. But, you know, the more I've read of Joel Osteen and the more I've seen of his public teaching, the more confident I am that he does need to be warned of as a false teacher, as one who would hold out the gospel of earthly prosperity rather than the gospel of the forgiveness of sins that leads us through much suffering and tribulation. The world abounds with false teachers. 
And it is my job as a shepherd when I see such false teachers influencing my sheep to single out that teaching and combat it. I had an interesting opportunity to do that on Wednesday at the Lutheran home. We do have a resident at the Lutheran home who's a practicing Jehovah's Witness. Her name is Tenna. And uh, when I've seen her, she's talked about how she doesn't know when she was born because birthdays don't matter. She was born in Denmark. And then uh, having lived through World War II, having interacted with German soldiers, Nazi soldiers, she came finally to the United States and was rather lost over here until some very kind people took her under their wings, the Jehovah's Witnesses. And then she learned that the Trinity is a false construct of the philosophical mind, that birthdays are not to be observed, that church holidays are a thing of the devil. She learned all of these things and she still holds to those beliefs. And she holds them tenaciously when I speak with her. Now, I don't consider her a false teacher. She's someone who has been led astray by others. And I'll do everything I can to try and feed her with the pure pasture of God's Word. But on Wednesday, as I was leaving the chapel and coming toward my office, I was approached by a man who said to me, Pastor, it must be difficult to encourage all of these people here. And I said, well, it's, it is difficult, but it's a joyful task, and so on. And he said, I was just encouraging Tenna, just encouraging her by reading to her from Hebrews about how God will remember all of her good works. And that brings great comfort to her. And I said to him, well, Tenna is a difficult case because as a Jehovah's Witness, she trusts in her own works rather than trusting in the death of God's Son to pay for her sin. And this man said to me, well, Tenna believes in Jesus Christ with all her heart. And I asked, are you a Jehovah's Witness? I said, yes, I'm proud to say that I am a child of Jehovah. And I would like to ask you how you defend this philosophy of the Trinity that you have. Well, praise God. Largely through all of this time spent uh, in the last couple of weeks on this STM thesis dealing with Trinitarian theology, the scriptural testimonies came flowing out. And after a few minutes of that, our Jehovah's Witness teacher said to me, Well, it was nice to banter with you, and headed out the door. I could almost see the tail tucked between his legs, the wolf fleeing from the flock of God. Yes, that is the task of a pastor, the task of a shepherd, to warn the sheep of false teaching, to deliver them from that which would destroy their souls. But it's kind of a tough thing to do sometimes. It's easy to feel mean if you single people out. But it's all to be done with an awareness that it's in obedience to Christ and it's for the benefit of His flock. I pray, God, that as your shepherd, I may truly lead and feed and defend the people of God entrusted to my care. But thankfully, I can assure you that even if I fail in my task, which is entirely possible and even likely. Even if I fail in my task, you nevertheless have your good shepherd who will never let Satan snatch you out of his hand, who will lead you and feed you and defend you and bring you safely through all of the snares of the devil unto life everlasting. Thanks be to God for our good shepherd, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.